and we're going to get into some of the research that we've been doing on cold tolerance of soybean gallonage. Let's see here. Okay, yeah, so one of the first things is just why are we looking at cold tolerance in particular? Uh, because the insects are cold-blooded, they can't control their own body temperature. So essentially, they just have to be at the temperature of the environment around them. This can leave them pretty vulnerable to environmental conditions and can end up being a pretty major determinant of their range. So understanding, understanding how they overwinter, the strategies they use, and how cold they ultimately can survive can really help us to understand where it might be at risk, where a pest might be able to spread to, and so on. What we do know for soybean gallonage is that it overwinters in the soil, in silken cocoons, so there's an insulating effect there, but we don't really know anything else yet about how, like what kinds of temperatures they can survive, what if a particularly cold winter will kill a lot of them off, etc. So that's what we're going to focus on. And to try to gain some insights into that, we have this methodology. Uh, we went out and collected infected soybean towards the end of the season uh, in both 2022 and 2023. This was in uh, Luverne, down in southwest Minnesota in 2022, and then just over in South Dakota and Del Rapids this year. We went out and collected soybean just as it was starting to senesce and when all of the larvae would be naturally dropping out shortly after. Brought it back to the lab and what we wanted to do is basically kind of trick the SGM into thinking it is going into winter. So we dissected out mature larvae from the stems that we knew would be dropping out soon. And set them up in vials of sand to essentially simulate them dropping out of the plant into soil. This would prompt them to start actually spinning their cocoons and go into winter mode, essentially. We then held the cocoons in those vials of sand at 37 degrees Fahrenheit, so cool but not too cold yet, uh, with a shortened day length of 10 hours to just keep simulating the winter conditions. And then after they sat at those conditions for one and two months, we measured their cold tolerance with two different experiments. And these two timings were picked to see if they displayed any adaptation over time. So the first measurement of cold tolerance we wanted to take is a pretty simple one. It's just the freezing point. In order to do this, we attach the cocoons to these wires like you can see on the left. Um, they're called thermocouples. They allow us to get a live readout of the temperature that the insect is experiencing over time. And then we cool, we cool these cocoons down until we saw evidence of freezing. So if you take a look at this graph on the left, this is the type of thing we would be seeing. On the y-axis, you can see temperature decreasing over time on the x-axis. But then we get these little blips, and what those are are because of some of the chemistry of how ice crystals form, when they start to form, they actually release heat. So we see the temperature go up, and then we can read across, figure out what temperature they started to freeze at. And we basically just did that with a big sample size and got some averages. <coughs> Let's take a look at those results. So here we're going to have on the y-axis of these graphs the uh, mean freezing point that we measured. I just point out that the graphs are going down into the negative temperatures. And then we have our one and two month storage times. So here in 2022, we saw mean freezing points around negative nine to negative 10 essentially. We've got our means and then we've got standard error bars around there. And then in 2023, it's not too different. We have more of a negative 7 to negative 8 range, but again, taking a look at our error bars, there is a lot of overlap here. We did some statistical tests and didn't see any differences between the one and two month time, so no evidence of adaptation over time in this case.
So that tells us about what temperatures they're freezing at, but we don't know how that relates to their mortality. They might die before they freeze, they might even die after. Insects have a lot of strategies for dealing with potential freezing. So for our next experiment, we wanted to record lethal temperatures. For this, we used a similar setup with the thermocouple wires. We just had something slightly different, keeping them in gel capsules. And then we chose five temperatures based on those, super, those uh, freezing point ranges we looked at before and cooled the cocoons down to them as soon as we saw that they had reached that temperature. We brought them back up to room temperature, dissected open the cocoons, and checked if they were alive an hour later. Um, typically, if they were alive, they would start moving around as soon as we opened up those cocoons, so it was pretty easy to check. And let's take a look at what we've got for this data. So here we're going to have on the y-axis the proportion of them that were dead at a given temperature that we tested on the x-axis. And I'm just going to show both of these years at once because it's a pretty similar pattern between them. Basically, we see pretty high survival up to this negative four-ish temperature, and then it really starts to drop off pretty quickly. So between negative four and negative 13, up to around 75% of them are dying. And we never saw an individual that survived exposure to negative 22. Interestingly, that same range, if I add in a line here, these lines represent the overall average freezing points that we saw earlier, and they line up pretty well. So it seems like there might be some kind of a relationship where when they freeze, they die, but I'll touch on that a little bit more later on. So that's some information that we've got on their cold tolerance as measured in the lab, but how does this relate to what they might actually experience out in the field in the soil? Well, we got some historical soil temperature data from a couple places, shout out Grand Forks as well, but then we also have uh, data from Morris and Lamberton. Um, on the y-axis here, you guys see the coldest temperature that was observed for a given month on the x-axis, and there's going to be a bunch of dots that represent different years for those temperatures. And this is at the two-inch depth, which is within the range soybean, soybean gallage would be overwintering at. So again, each of these dots is a different year. These are broadly within the past 20 years. I'll add in a line that averages all these together into one. And then I'm going to add in a line down at the bottom that represents the freezing point that we saw earlier. So the soil really never actually gets as cold as it needs to get to kill them, as far as we can tell but that's with a brief exposure. So the next question this brings us to is, they look pretty cold tolerant so far, but what if they're kept cold for longer periods of time? So we did an experiment for that, and this one was just done this year. These are pretty new results. A lethal time experiment. So we had the same acclimation period with this 37 degree temperature for a while. But then we split some of these whole vials of sand with the cocoons inside off to two cooler temperatures, that being the 26.6 and 14 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we planned to do this experiment where we would take a couple vials out to room temperature every once in a while throughout the season. We originally planned every two weeks or so. And we planned to do this for around six months to simulate a whole winter spent at these conditions. We bring them back up to room temperature, dissect open the cocoon, see if they were alive or not. So we started doing this. Um, I'll show you some results here. Uh, so on the y-axis here, we're going to have the uh, proportions of live versus dead cocoons that were in these vials that we checked. And our first check here was just right away. It was essentially a control. So our zero week timing. Uh, they're doing fine. These are all these orange color live cocoons. But then we get out to one week, and 
we suddenly have a bunch of mortality, uh, even at this comparatively warm 26 degree temperature. And when we go to two weeks, uh, all of those at the cooler temperatures are actually dead. And our acclimation temperature, the 37, is still doing just fine. So this is kind of surprising because this 26 degree temperature is a lot warmer than where we we're seeing them freeze around the negative 10 range. This meant we had to change our plans a fair bit. So we set up a abridged experiment where we basically look at them within a range going up to five days. So we've got like a zero hour immediate check, three days, or three hours, one day, three days, so on. And we also chose to just look at the warmer of those temperatures, 26, because we we're having such high mortality there. So I'll show you the whole top row here. Um, they're doing fine, all the way up to one day. Um, they're looking just as well as the control warmer population was. Then we get down here to three days, and suddenly there is a pretty big drop off here, pretty high mortality. And at five days, it's, it's looking pretty similar, not too much more has happened. So, mortality seems to start increasing around three days of exposure to just 26 degrees Fahrenheit. So in summary, what did we learn from all this? Well, it looks like overwintering soybean gallmage are relatively tolerant to brief exposures to these cold temperatures. But uh, even at these much warmer temperatures, although still below freezing, a freezing point of water, uh, they're really not surviving longer periods of exposure well. And there could be a couple things going on here. One thing we'd like to explore more is there might be some kind of effect of soil moisture, where if soils are wetter and the soils freeze, they can kind of force the insects to freeze at a warmer temperature. That may be killing them. We'll need to explore that more. Which brings us to future work. Um, you know, it could also be the case that that soil is a pretty good insulator, and they just don't actually tend to get cold for three or seven days at 26 degrees Fahrenheit in a row that often. So we'd like to explore this soil data that we have, see how often that actually happens. Um, there's this interesting overlap in the freezing point and the kinds of temperatures that they die at a lot. It'd be nice to explore that more and to establish for sure if they freeze, do they die? And there are some statistical analyses to wrap up to with that uh, lethal temperature and also the lethal time work. But I'm not expecting too much to change there because the trends that we're seeing are pretty stark.